YouTube and welcome back to another episode of Curse Review. Today we're once again diving into the world of horror and dissecting how a nightmare on Elm Street subverts the slasher genre. Wes Craven's iconic film is a masterclass in defying expectations and challenging the conventions of the typical slasher flick. So let's explore how it did just that. First off, let's briefly discuss the slasher genre and its conventions. Slasher films typically follow a formula. A masked or disfigured killer, a group of young victims, and a relentless pursuit resulting in often gory, if not predictable, deaths. Humans have long enjoyed watching people inflict pain upon others. But in regards to the origins of slasher and horror films, there are accounts of said fictionalized violence embodied in late 19th century horror plays produced at the Grand Guignol. In the 1930s, the Hayes Code led to the entertainment industry cracking down on overly sexualized and violent content, along with Hitchcock's Psycho and the Splatter and Gaeo movies from Italy slashers began to grow to true prominence. This was about in the 1960s, 1970s. I would say the inciting incident for the overwhelming popularity of slashers was John Carpenter's stone-cold 1978 classic, Halloween. The only, the classic, Halloween. But there is an argument to be made that Texas Chainsaw, which predates Halloween by two years, is overall much more iconic in setting the slasher standard. I grew up watching the subsequent Halloween sequels and Friday the 13th sequels on AMC, typically catching one or two after hopping off the bus and slipping in underneath the garage with my latchkey. A Nightmare on Elm Street would show up on the boob tube from time to time, but it was honestly a little bit too scary for me. And so I really didn't revisit the franchise until I decided to make this video. Reagan conservatism is hugely connected to the slasher craze, as well as the threat of child endangerment and kidnapping that was prevalent in the 1980s. The the supposed golden age of slashers was anywhere between 1978 to 1984, and that kind of ended with the aforementioned conservatism that Reagan brought to the country with his election. Who's was black, Ronald Reagan was the devil, and the government is lying about 9-11. Thank you for your time. And good night. Nightmare on Elm Street actually helped revitalize the slasher genre after this conservative wave hit the United States. That's all to say that Wes Craven's efforts here were riding a real wave of cash cow horror flicks, and it was great to see that even back then they executed something so wholly unique. As opposed to Friday the 13th and other movies of the genre, Nightmare on Elm Street sticks with you a little bit longer than most slasher flicks do. A Nightmare on Elm Street subverts your expectations in brilliant ways. Freddy Krueger, the main antagonist, isn't just a physical threat. He's a menace in our character's dreams, blurring the lines between reality and the dream world. Instead of a physical pursuit, Freddy invades the character's subconscious turning their dreams into a horrifying playground. This innovative twist challenged the slasher genre's norms and gave us something entirely new. Another way A Nightmare on Elm Street subverts the slasher genre is through its complex characterization and backstory. Typically, slasher films focus more on the killer than the victims, who are often one-dimensional. A Nightmare on Elm Street gives us well-developed characters with depth fear, and histories. This movie delves into the emotional and psychological trauma that Freddy inflicts on the victims, adding more layers of complexity to the narrative. In traditional slasher films, the killer is often depicted as an unstoppable force, and A Nightmare on Elm Street flips that dynamic on its head. Our protagonist, Nancy, and her friends learn to fight back against Freddy in their dreams. They discover his weaknesses and use their wits and ingenuity to turn the table on him. This inversion of power challenges the typical notion of the invincible slasher, making the film even more engaging. I wager here that the real battle that Nancy is fighting is with her mother and father. As her friends drop off one by one, and Nancy begins to unravel the layers to this nightmare, her parents both fail to truly believe her claims. And why should they? Of course, walking in on a friend that's just been murdered in front of your eyes? That would fuck anyone up. Why should our teenage daughter be any different? And that's kind of the problem. Remember in the Peanuts cartoons when Charlie Brown 
Brown and Co. would ever interact with adults, it always sounded like wah, 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 wah. the kids couldn't understand their motives. That's kind of how the adults are in Nightmare on Elm Street. Clueless, disinterested, and oftentimes not even there. But they move past these tropes, forming interesting family and character dynamics. This is especially true of Nancy's mother Marge, played by Ronnie Blakely. As Nancy seems to be getting crazier and crazier, we begin to find out that Marge is just as out of control of her own fear as Nancy. She thinks that she had taken care of Freddy in the past and that her daughter would be safe. This generational trauma, the pain that Marge carried and subsequently passed on to Nancy here with her fear of Freddy could be seen as a metaphor of how children are expected to carry their parents' emotional turmoil and distress. Emotionally abused parents often expect their children to carry weight and burden without speaking up or talking about it. Children can be punished for trying to heal their own inner child because their parents were never given the opportunity. Nancy's parents are emotionally abusive and negligent to her. And when Nancy does speak up and plead that people listen to her, her mother literally builds a prison around her. Nancy returns home to find bars on all the windows and that the doors are locked from the inside. This illustrates the way that parents can box their children in and gaslight them, trap them into thinking that mommy and daddy know best. Even Nancy's father, Donald, continues to chastise and scold her, even if it means that when you want your daughter to go to sleep, Freddie might just be waiting there to kill her. But don't question that status quo. You need to listen to your parents because they know best. Your parents may have kept you alive, but did they really have your best interests at heart? Did they truly answer your questions or concerns growing up, or just ignore you and punish you for asking too many questions, for asking for help? Millennials are apparently the ones who are insufferable and anxiety ridden. But you go talk to any Gen X or Boomer out there and you'll see that they're not all that different from us. They just dealt with lower interest rates. I'll end this character growth section by saying that while I initially thought Heather Langenkamp, who plays Nancy, our final girl, wasn't that great of an actor in this role, the more I mulled over it and was working on my script for this episode, I started to really appreciate the candidness and the naivete and kind of blunt overacting that she brought to the role. She really harnesses that that angst, pain, and emotional overdrive that teenagers are going through. And especially when your family and your friends and townspeople are not paying attention to you when you're in pain and you need help, she really nails that role. So I really enjoyed her. And the more I think about her role in the movie, she might be like the best part of Nightmare on Elm Street. Lastly, let's talk about the themes of fear and control. The slasher genre often exploits the fear of violence and gore for shock value. A Nightmare on Elm Street digs deeper, exploring the fear of losing control over one's mind and dreams. It delves into the subconscious, highlighting the vulnerability we all have when we're most defenseless, when we sleep. Sleep is the true killer in Elm Street. In the book Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker, he says, humans need more than seven hours of sleep each night to maintain cognitive performance. After 10 days of just seven hours of sleep, the brain is as dysfunctional as it would be after going without sleep for 24 hours. There are some incredible sight gags throughout Elm Street, but one of my favorites is one where Nancy has convinced her mother Marge that she's finally going to go to sleep, and Marge carries out an armful of an empty coffee pot, mugs, and energy pills, and as soon as she turns the light off and closes the door, Nancy hops out of bed and we find that she's been brewing another pot of coffee underneath her nightstand. To have a burn victim child predator chasing you in your dreams is one thing, but the terror of not being able to sleep is the true horror of this movie. I didn't find this movie to be utterly terrifying, but I do think the movie is very clever and has some incredible practical effects and wonderful ambiance and music. All the stimuli we see on our phones, TVs, and screens, not to mention everything we see just out in the waking world as we're walking about and doing things, can amalgamate into some horrific imagery during our REM cycles. Freddy is a perfect fulcrum for Wes Craven to explore this idea. Not to mention you need an icon to carry a slasher flick franchise. But it's not what Freddy's doing on screen that is so scary. It's the idea that his very presence can keep you from falling into a deep sleep until you 
finally gnawed off, depleted. And while I don't find Freddy himself to be that effective of a slasher villain, Nightmare on Elm Street stands as a unique and special entry into the genre. This wouldn't be my first choice if I was going to pick a slasher flick to watch this Halloween, but it sure as hell was fun to watch, and it made me even more excited to revisit Wes Craven later on on this channel. In conclusion, A Nightmare on Elm Street stands as a groundbreaking film that defied the conventions of the slasher genre. It challenged the norm by subverting expectations, presenting complex characters, inverting power dynamics, and exploring deeper themes of fear and control. And while it might not be one of my favorites, I can really see why other people view it as a true horror classic. And it is definitely worth being visited if you haven't seen it before. If you like this video, please consider liking and punching that subscribe button so that you stay notified of all the amazing content coming out later on this channel. Please feel free to comment below your thoughts on A Nightmare on Elm Street and if there's any other Freddy movies that you like in the franchise. I hope you all are having a fantastic October so far, and until next time, peace. Phew, man. I am tired after that Curtis review. Phew. Mm.